Welcome to Club Soda's Mindful Drinking Festival. We're online, global, and as always, absolutely free. Hi, I'm Drew, and I'm one of the co-founders of Club Soda. And I'm Laura, the other co-founder of Club Soda. We help you change your drinking in ways that help you live well. So whether you're looking to cut down, stop for a bit or quit, you can find what you need from podcasts and books and courses on joinclubsoda.com. This festival, we've brought you an amazing lineup from over 100 people from across the world. And our programme this time really is global. Every day starts Down Under with me, Sarah. As well as organising the festival in Australia, I spend my time looking for alcohol-free alternatives and tips for people who choose not to drink, but who still want to live a social, fun and adventurous life. And I'll be wrapping up each day here in the States. I'm Amanda, your US festival host and coordinator, and I'm also a mindset coach who helps women change their relationship with alcohol so that they can start living their most authentic life. Each day with a rolling program of inspirational panels, conversations, social events, and opportunities to discover new low and low alcohol drinks. So whether you want inspiration to change your drinking or to connect with other people, or you want to discover and enjoy a new low and no alcohol drink. The Mindful Drinking Festival is for you. Cheers. 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 Hello. How are we all? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello, <laughs> <laughs> like, Hello. hi. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Hello, everyone who is joining this evening. We're talking about uh, mindful drinking and its impact on mental wealth. And that's not a typo. That's what we're talking about. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little while. But my name is Ruth Cooper Dixon. I'm the founder of Shamps, which we are on the virtual Shamps motivation stage, which if you've joined any of the other fantastic talks uh, over the last three days, uh, from the Global Mindful Drinking Festival. You'll have heard lots about uh, champs popping up. So we're here and we've got our own fizz, which we're drinking from uh, Thompson and Scott's Naughty, alcohol-free wine, which we'll go through. We'll have a little taste test of that later. Rod has already nearly taken her ceiling out. Of, <laughs> of I, have. I have. It was um, difficult <laughs> <laughs> So I'm joined by a fab lineup of panellists tonight. Uh, Tori Felder, the retired party girl, uh, Dr. Rada. And Dave Cooper, who, yes, that is my brother. So I've, I've got him on the panel this evening. So if I'd love them to introduce themselves first of all. So Tori, do you want to kick off and just give sure. yourself a little intro? Yes. Uh, my name is Tori. I am the founder of The Retired Party Girl, which is a community space for sober and sober curious women who are retired from the party, but still want to live social, joyful and empowering lives. I started RPG in February of 2020, and my website and sober workbook are launching later this month. And I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Thank you. Rada, Dr. Rada, sorry, official title. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you can call me Rada, it's fine. So, yes, hello, I'm Dr. Rada Modgel. I'm a GP, um, NHS GP, and also broadcaster. So, I broadcast on radio and television. Um, I've written and contributed to some books as well. And one of my massive passions is really around uh, particularly sort of mental health, emotional well being. Uh, but also, my real passion is really about sharing people's stories so we can learn from each other, we can develop tools and strategies to help ourselves and empower ourselves really to change the things we want to change in our life and I'm really interested in how stories and how sharing experiences and reducing shame and stigma can really help that so I'm really delighted to be here as well thank you. Thank you and last but not least Dave. Hi yeah thanks for having me um, my name is Dave, Dave Cooper, um, I'm a former Royal Marine, Royal Marines Commando and um, also spent time in the uh, UK Special Forces Support Group um, a career spanning over sort of 11 years, uh, operational tours in Northern Ireland, Iraq, twice in Afghanistan. Um, very much a social drinker. And over the last sort of 10 years, that's probably turned to more of a stressful, emotional drinker, I would say. Um, recently completed the One Year No Beer 28 Day Challenge. Um, <laughs> um, now up into the sort of 70s, it wasn't there. Yeah, so we're. Uh, doing okay with it. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks, guys, for, for joining this evening. Um, 
I mean, the reason Shams got involved with the Mindful Drinking Festival was my own journey of uh, sobriety. So I stopped drinking coming up for 21 months next week. Um, so almost two years. And thank you. And for me, it was um, my medication that I take for my panic disorder, which I started in March of 2018. And um, a sort of a battle from March to November of trying to reconcile being able to still drink what I drank before, which probably in some cases was too much and in, in, in lots of kind of socializing and, you know, not knowing the switch off button, as I like to call it. And in the end, just after really a couple of nights of just really feeling rubbish physically more even more so than mentally was just like enough's enough and just made the decision to do a 12 month challenge bizarrely November the 9th and then stuck with it ever since because I feel so much has opened up for me in terms of um, the life the community I feel 100% better and I've not had a panic attack for for well over a year now which I do attribute to the fact that I don't drink anymore and at Shams we talk about mental wealth because we don't just talk about um, mental health from it you know often people associate that rather, rather as you will know as a, a kind of you know they go straight to anxiety depression they don't think of the positives and for me mental health and well-being is a fusion of those two words and I when we look at our we have a program called my mental wealth which is a health and well-being coaching program and the, the M stands for mindful mindfulness and this isn't just about being all zen and doing yoga I mean that's great but it's also about mindful drinking mindful eating mindful choices mindful response you know just slowing everything down a little bit and just where we get our fun from our enjoyment our you know like how do we go through life um I think one thing we've realized this year that life is short it can be things can be taken away from us and I think lots of people have had I know from my reflections this year, both personally and professionally, that people have been pausing and just actually stopping to reflect a lot on what's going off in their life and what choices they are making and how that impacts them. And I think we're all kind of looking at our health and well-being, um, and it's it's linked with our mental health as well. So that probably leads me to my first question, Rod, because this is kind of in in your area. Um, how how you know with alcohol and the concept of being a mindful drinker how do you sort of see that as people do they do they often talk to you when they talk about anxiety depression is alcohol often used as that coping strategy and what you know what kinds of things do you generally chat to you know when, when you're on the radio when you're doing your podcast like what sorts of things tend to come out from those sorts of conversations mm, so that's a, a great question so um when, when people often get to the stage of talking about their anxiety or their depression, or they come in to see me as a GP or even in my broadcasting work. Um, they're, what's interesting, I think, is they're more likely to feel comfortable talking about their anxiety than they are to actually talk about the, the drinking as a sort of coping strategy. And, and often you actually have to ask a very direct question about what is your coping strategy or a very direct question about you know do you ever use alcohol as a coping strategy and I think that's really interesting because obviously over the last five six years we've tried to get better at talking about mental health which is fantastic but I think actually um alcohol and how we drink is actually there's there's so much more layered stigma and layered shame onto that than there now is you know compared to mental health so in my experience it's very much a sort of you have to ask that direct question or build that that rapport with someone before they're able to say you know what they're doing in order to cope for example with their mental health if it is a coping strategy obviously it, it's about unpicking whether or not you know which which one kind of came first in a way it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day when they you know when people come for help really they're intertwined and so it's it's, it's almost a matter of saying okay well let's try and unpick them and see what's going on and see what's happening um but I think I think for for me one of the real sort of things that we need to start talking about a lot more is how um when people are are drinking perhaps too much or they're drinking in a pattern or a way that is you know destructive to their lives and how they're able to function in their lives the biggest thing that really happens to them or the biggest thing that is a barrier another barrier to reaching for help is the breakdown in relationships and friendships um perhaps because of behaviors or because of their experiences while they've been drinking and i think we need to start talking about 
how we can try to preserve and conserve relationships uh, when people are drinking in a in a pattern that is not great for them because again it's the relationships and the closeness of those relationships that actually helps that person then seek help and actually ask for help with their drinking or with their mental health for example mm. and that's often the first thing that gets kind of worn away or eroded and um, so I think it's really important to talk about um, why there's still sort of shame about talking about alcohol um, and shame about talking about drinking patterns and habits, for example, and really get to the crux of what we can do to preserve relationships from an early stage of that as well. Uh, so that's so interesting because I, I listened to an, uh, another talk um, today at lunchtime with Sheru, um, who wrote The Kindness Method oh, about yeah. habits and, and just even that whole link between the habits we have with drinking, but also then the behaviors and, and those relationships. And I, and I guess often when people, I know with me, when I came, when I went to my GP, it was, I'd already had the, the, the meltdown, the breakdown in the office. And that, that was at the point I was went to my GP. I didn't kind of go, uh, you know, I yeah. should have had much before. So I guess a lot mm. of the time you see people when they're, at that mm -hmm. point where they've got no other mm -hmm. option or they feel no one else can talk to them. Tori, um, obviously you've, you've created this community um, on, you know, a social, you're, you're growing this community and, and that's obviously come from personal circumstance. Do you relate to a lot of what, uh, of what Rod has just been talking about there? Yes, definitely. So I started going to cognitive behavioral therapy when I was 21. I didn't stop drinking until I was 25. And there were so many times where my therapist tried to link my mental health issues to my drinking behaviors, and I just wasn't willing to see that link. And I think a lot of that shame comes from just the way it is in the media. And then in my age group specifically, being 21 is the age you can drink in America. And so it's normal to get blacked out. On your 21st birthday, that's kind of the goal. They want to see you falling over. And it's not a true 21st birthday unless you throw up and your body rejects the alcohol that was just, you know, filtered through it. So um, it took me four years of consistent cognitive behavioral therapy to finally make the link that my mental health was worsening because of my drinking. Mm. And that whole, I mean, both of you have mentioned um, the word shame, you know, and, and that's such a powerful word. Um, you know, I, th I think it conjures an emotional response in, in almost anybody, you know, because it's it's so it's so deep. Um, it is, yeah. And Dave, I just I'm just thinking, you know, with your experience of being in you know especially the Royal Marines which is all you know all male um it, do you think there's probably when we talk about alcohol and drinking especially around stress and coping in that kind of environment that's quite a, a challenging concept for guys to kind of get their heads around or be a more more open about should I say yeah definitely I think you know certainly being sort of a male and in that military environment they're two very sort of domineering groups and when you put them together they're even sort of more powerful um so the yeah it, i mean the military sort of drinking culture was very sort of certainly it was when when i was in um very kind of excessive and you was kind of frowned upon if you if you weren't going to drink um and you know that was just the kind of way that you kind of you know, decompressed a lot of those emotions and scenarios that you kind of gone through was through 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 drinking. So yeah, it was, you know that drinking culture was really, um, yeah, it was, it was it was quite excessive to a degree. Yeah, and I think I think what's interesting is both Tori, you spoke about you know as you know in the states it's it's twenty one, so it's kind of that's the, the you know twenty one age birthday everyone it, that's a thing and everyone but you know that's the goal. <clears throat> Excuse me, and Dave, you know it's frowned on. It's it's almost like these. It's almost linked to that whole expectation of what you do. It's not a, it's not a choice, right? It's not a okay. I'm I'm not going to drink, or even I'm going to have a few drinks, but not black out, or yeah. drink till I my body <clears throat> is technically poisoned and, yeah. and I'm throwing up or or whatever. So I think that because uh, what we're saying here is we're not saying 
you can't drink, you're not supposed to drink, it's okay to use, you know, have a nice glass of wine or whatever your choice of drink is with friends or socializing. But it's about, I think it's about those choices and, and that community aspect. Do you think it's, Tori, do you think it's easier when you've got friends around? Have you found now your sort of your because you're sober you're obviously going through your sober journey at the moment so where is it easier for you to have friends that are more mindful drinkers than a group who are let's go out and get yeah. so i had tried not drinking a year and a half before i finally made this decision to stop drinking in december 2019 before the new year and I just, I feel like looking back now, I didn't stand a chance because I didn't have that community. And that's what really inspired me to start the Retired Party Girl Instagram and to reach out and to create this community is because that's what holds me accountable. And that's what helps me feel like I can live this joyful, sexy, adventurous, fun life without drinking was seeing these other people before me do it. And I hadn't ever seen that before. I was telling Dr. Rodhop before that I didn't know personally another sober person my age. And so in my head, sobriety looked dull and boring and it looked older than me. And it looked like a lot of men in the AA meetings. And I just didn't feel like I fit in that demographic. And a lot of wellness spaces are whitewashed and I am a person of color. And so I didn't see any representation as far as my race and my age. And um, once I went on Instagram and found sober communities, it was like the heavens opened up, the clouds opened up and sun was mm -hmm. down. Cause I was like, <laughs> oh my goodness, there are people who are just like me who still want to socialize, who still, I want to go dancing all night. who still want to do karaoke and who still want to live these really full adventurous young lives, but just don't want to be hung over. Don't want to have to deal with the shame. Don't want to have the mental health issues that come with excessive drinking. Rada, you, you in terms of your social media, because you you put out. I mean, I dubbed you my kindness influencer over no. over <laughs> lockdown because well, didn't do that. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> because you've just been so lovely in terms of your what you put out there that's relatable to people. And you know, hearing Tori say that she found that community. I mean, that's how you and I initially met through through social as well. Um, do you think that's a good way for people to connect and to find, yeah, you because know, you, you start you started with you know when we first started talking about connections and building those connections. Do you think that's a way that people can find people like them or you know get that, understand you know there isn't just one way of doing things when it comes to you know your own well being? Yeah, absolutely. As you say, I think, you know, from what we've heard from from Dave and Tori, and obviously in our own experiences, my own experience as well, is that, you know, um, often there's a, there's a huge element of peer pressure. There's a huge element of conditioning of, in society of, you know, at different stages, you know, it might be, you know, when we're first allowed to drink, when we go to university, what we're expected to do. And that comes in lots of different areas of our life. You know, we should we should be married by this age and we should tick this other box and have a property by this age. And and it's, a, it's another type of social conditioning where we see images all around us. We absorb those images as we, as we grow up. We feel like we have to conform to those images. Otherwise, we're going to be judged by other people. We're going to be excluded. We're going to um we're going to have an internal sort of element of of shame and judgment from others and because we're social creatures as humans we want to be part of a group we then go along with that until we start to then work out hang on a minute is this true is it not true is what i'm being told actually correct or not and do i want to and even if it is correct do i want to actually go along with that and and realizing then you have a choice to step out of that which i think is is an amazing thing to do in lots of different ways but particularly with this idea of of drinking or not drinking and you know in my radio work particularly i deal with a lot of young people who are going mm. freshers week and students and that you know that's a huge amount of peer pressure there's been a lot more movement towards people talking about the fact they don't want to but there's still a massive pressure on that. And then you you start you start getting embroiled in this thing. And you think, actually, I don't even like the taste. I mean, most of us probably didn't even like the taste of wine or beer when we first tasted it. <laughs> and yet we carry on kind of just drinking it because it's socially acceptable. So I think I think you're definitely right. I think social media is an amazing place when you find your, your tribe of people, you find other people like you, you find other people who've had similar experiences, who are um, voicing exactly how you feel. And that goes for everything. That goes for mental health. It goes for, you know, drinking 
drinking behaviors. It goes for, you know, seeing people who look like you, who you see part of yourself in. And so when you don't feel so alone and you feel like you're not the only one, then that shame reduces. And when that shame reduces, you can then start being more empowered and actually stepping into your power to be who you want to be and live your life how you want to live it. Um, and I think the second element of it is the coping strategies. And again, you know, using um, drink as a coping strategy for pain and mental pain, for example, emotional pain. And I think that's another element where, you know, we need to start talking much more on social media about how we can help people, all of us, myself included, everyone, to be more emotionally aware what's happening in our bodies, in our minds, how are we feeling? And if we're feeling a certain way, we can recognize that what actions do we then take to help ourselves feel better and what strategies do we have and which strategies are helpful for us and mm. which strategies actually make us feel worse and I think that awareness of our emotional space is really the key to unlocking the changes that we want to make in our lives in lots of different areas. Yeah I think everything you've just said there Dave with your journey so you came across one one year no beer, didn't you? Um, so talk, yeah. talk to us because that links into kind of very much around finding that group. How did you come across um, one year no beer? And what for you was it that made you, you know, I, I just stopped um, and, and just kind of did it on my own. But you actually utilized that as a, as a community. So what for you help was that, you know, why did that help you, do you think? Yeah, for me, it was it was it was a a great place to start really um and it just gave me that platform of to kind of make me understand my own relationship with alcohol um i think my kind of sober curious mind let me dip into it a couple of times and then i, I quickly pulled out and went to the fridge and got a drink <laughs> listening to sort of, you know other stories from like yourself ruth and, and other people that i knew that had kind of stopped drinking and they were telling me these you know great stories about how they got more time and energy and vitality and they've got that sparkle and oomph back um in the lives it kind of I, th I think i went i took the dog out for a walk and listened to a podcast um and I, I was away for about an hour and a half and it kind of like blew me away a little bit i came home told my wife that i was gonna take a break from drinking and she looked at me like i'd got two heads <laughs> um, well, the, the community was it, it was great I think listening to other experiences of people that were kind of going through that journey um, it was also quite reassuring to know that all these routines and triggers that everybody else it was normal you know and mm -hmm. I, it kind of gave me that bit of reassurance that it wasn't a, a bad thing if that makes sense um, and I think you know having that community with people that were going through it and also, you know, the stuff that you, you get from the one year no beer, um, so, you know, your, your emails, your videos and your, your daily tasks, it kind of, for me anyway, it forced me down that path to be completely honest with myself um, and explore myself a little bit, if, uh, if that's the right word. I think, mm. you know, when you're kind of brutally honest with yourself, and you know, and you, you can sit and write down all your kind of insecurities and weaknesses and flaws or areas that you want to improve on. Um, it kind of, you know, sets you up a little bit, makes you a little bit bulletproof to some negativity. Because if you're aware of you those yourself, it doesn't matter kind of what anyone says. Mm. You know, you can kind of push it back and say, yeah, I know, I know I'm like that. And that's why I, mm. I kind of, you know, want to go through this journey. But it also, having that community there as well, it kind of, mentally prepared me to I know you stopped just stopped and you know didn't <laughs> yeah. drink whereas yeah. I, I, you know, for me it was my relationship what it was like I think I had to kind of mentally prepare myself whether that's something that I do in you know in everyday life where I mentally prepare myself so I can physically go through that um otherwise I kind of like lose that motivation quite quickly and I just rely on emotions and when I rely on emotions it often leads to slip ups and, and failures so yeah it was it was good to be in that to get me within the you know, community thank you that's sort of really very open and honest there um to share so thank you and i think it's also you know we've we've talked a lot about shame we've talked you know and and rada talked about um those connections where the behaviors that you you know 
things you've perhaps done and there was that shame yeah. and and you know which impacts us even more in terms of our own self-worth and then you being able to say look I'm being a, a totally honest here with myself and I'm, I'm which isn't easy to do right none of us like to hold that mirror up and go yeah I'm not good at this and this is mm -hmm. a flaw and I can be like this and mm -hmm. I don't like that because we've all got you know no one's perfect but you know we try and hide everything because we try and mask all those bits of ourselves instead of going but actually like you say I love that idea of you actually thinking you know well I'm bulletproof because yeah I, I know all of these things about me and actually yeah I, that's okay um that is makes me me. Um, there is a question that's coming from Nicole. So she loves one year no beer. She's on day 290. So well done, Nicole. Uh, excellent. Um, she says it's a great community as well, Dave, but she can't see anyone. She's in Johannesburg and she does have a question, which um, I guess is for, for all three of you, really. She does say, um, how do you find fun, sober people in my area without looking and sounding like a weird goody goody? Uh, the, the sober movement is not really really know where I live so obviously she's in Johannesburg um Tori do you want to start with that one where do you think you could start yeah um you might think that the sober movement isn't known where you live but I would say go on Instagram and send messages I had no idea there's a huge group of us in Seattle and before going and finding them on Instagram I had no idea that they were there and some of them are basically my neighbors and in my same age group um and you might not be able to find your community exactly where you live, but if you can find them on Instagram and then maybe eventually plan a meetup in the future. Um, a lot of the sober accounts I follow host events and in-person events. It's been a little wonky with COVID, um, but there are so many resources through Instagram and that's really how I found my community. Brilliant. Rada, anything to mm. add to that, do you think? Um, I would probably just, just add, um, if, if there isn't one, how about you setting one up yourself <laughs> because, yeah. there you because go, actually, Nicole. What, you're, what you'll find is no I don't want to give you too much work Nicole sorry um, <laughs> what, what you'll find is is that um and I you know I found I think we've all found this haven't we with different things in our lives that actually when we are if we obviously if we feel comfortable enough to do that I don't want you to do anything you're not comfortable with publicly obviously but when we are comfortable enough to be honest and be authentic and actually say hey like this is who I am then what you do is you start to find people around you go I'm like that too and like oh actually don't tell anyone else but I'm like that too or you know and so actually you you know once you start opening up the subject you'll, you'll probably find loads of people gravitate towards you so that's the other idea obviously if you're comfortable enough to do that um d d have a go yourself because you you'll find probably lots and lots of people who are like thank you so much for setting that up I, I couldn't find anyone either <laughs> <laughs> well we've got Nicole says that's great she never thought of Instagram which is great um and there was another question um that came in as well so that was on the same subject so we've kind of covered that so thank you and I think we forget you know Instagram can be such a power well all social can but I found you know that's how I met both of you so you know I think it is a huge way to be able to set you can you know try you don't even have to go under your own name initially if you wanted to create you know the retired party girl I mean I it's just suddenly like oh no your real name's Tori <laughs> you know because it's it becomes like a brand in itself right so you could you could be behind you don't have to actually physically say this is me straight off you can go a little bit you don't have to put yourself no. front and center um so we've got somebody uh who's Caroline's asked a question I'm early on in my journey only at seven days but finding less hard than I thought thanks to reading Annie Grace's A Naked Mind but wondering how do you make weekends different from weekdays without a few bevies? Dave how how do you kind of I know weekends was often your ch drinking time of choice but how do you kind of like have you changed that mindset? Yeah well Fridays I used to think was like the most relaxing night of my week where I'd sit down and drink you know, four, six, even sometimes eight beers on a Friday night. And I thought that was my relaxing time. Looking back now, those Friday nights couldn't have been more stressful, if I'm honest, with two, you know, two children under eight in the house. Um, I suppose the good thing for me was as well, after about a week, uh, my wife kind of saw, well, I think she saw some benefits in going through that. So she went, she started as well. So she's up into her, 60s, 60 days, that's 60 days age. Oh, I didn't know um, that. Yeah, so our kind of Friday nights, um, 
we just stopped drinking really and did a lot of other things with and it sounds bad that we weren't doing things with the children but we were having a lot more family time and I can honestly say that I feel like now I've gained like an extra day on my weekend it's like so I'm not like hungover and lethargic and just feeling rubbish on a Saturday um I'm having I feel like I've got an extra day on a on a weekend um so now it's whether it's a Friday or a Saturday or a Tuesday, the, the days have kind of been they're insignificant, really. Mm. I think as well, Caroline, from my perspective, um, it's to, if you, you know, there's, there's alcohol-free options out there as well or other things you can have as a, as a nice treat. So I went yesterday, I met some friends um, for a birthday picnic and birthday swim, some new friends, actually. I'd, I hadn't met a lot of them before at the swim club. And... Um, I was a bit worried thinking as well that I'm going to have to explain why I don't drink. But I took a bottle of actually Naughty, which was the case. I did take a bottle of alcohol-free fizz. And actually, it felt like a party. And there was a couple of people actually driving. And they're like, oh, I'd rather have yours than the alcohol version. And it was still a nice little treat and have some scones with jam and cream and, and all those lovely things. But actually, that felt like a nice treat. Now, for me, I don't tend to drink even alcohol-free options whenever I drink them when I would perhaps be celebrating or wanting a nice glass of wine or an alcohol free beer or a, a you know a seed lip um, gin and tonic so I would have those as I would do as a treat like I would do at weekends when I was drinking so for me having those options as well is a nice alternative and they don't work for everybody you know some people like I think Radha you were saying like some people don't just don't like the taste and if you don't look for other I think the trouble is we, we associate alcohol so much with reward and to think about well you wouldn't if you wouldn't drink in the week Monday to Friday what else can you do that's rewarding so as Dave said having that extra day or buying yourself a nice I don't know like whatever your thing if it's I don't know, like a, a new top or a yeah. piece of cake or go for a nice breakfast. And also actually maybe Ruth as well, like um, try to think back to what you used to enjoy doing before mm. you were you were drinking alcohol because we often you know we often be like oh that was when I was little but actually the things that you enjoy when you were little I don't know like I don't know painting gardening running exercising music whatever it is you know what was in your life that you enjoyed and you used to really look forward to as a treat before alcohol came into your life and go back to those and start doing like be led by those and start doing those now or start trying those because actually you'll find that you'll still really love those and that will give you that enjoyment and that kind of slight different rewards on a weekend and give you that sense of a buzz I think I think we for we forget what we what we used to like when we were little still is inside of us mostly mm. not yeah all, not all of it, <laughs> but I it. Love that you said that I was just journaling about that because I feel like when I got sober I started to tap into that childlike joy mm. and little things like going out for ice cream which would be yeah. like why would I go out yeah. for ice cream it brings you like this giddiness and this joy and my new thing has been buying dresses which I probably shouldn't do but I love like twirling around in like a pretty little dress and going out to dinner in a dress and it's yeah. these little things I used to love dressing up as a child so it's, we're tapping into that childlike joy mm. and it's so special it's so special to return to that and and that's what we're talking about when it comes to mental wealth, right? We're talking about investing in ourselves, wealth, you know, all those fun, you know, living right on the coast now. I've never had so much ice cream. I had one Friday, <laughs> like a giant one with the flake in. I've had ice cream like probably every every few days while it's been sunny. But it is. I mean, I love that because I can. And I think when you start to bring that into your life and those fun things, like I'd never, you know, just being able to swim for me has been so beautiful and being mm. out in the fresh air. And so I think it is, it's, it's finding those things. Uh, somebody said they love the cake idea. Somebody said they rediscovered, they love reading. Um, I love thinking, if someone Zoe said, I love thinking back to what you loved as a child. She started crafting again and her mm. kids love that. Mm. Um, all very helpful comments. So what I would probably ask then at, um, I just probably want to answer one more question before I ask for your one top tip. I found this after having done a year that people then like, oh, so when are you going to start drinking again? And this isn't, again, this isn't what it's about because this is about being a mindful drinker. But there is a thing around, you may have stopped for a period of time or taken a bit of time out drinking. That doesn't mean to say you don't, you know, you can't, you can't start again. But where people are committed to more, you know, more sober living, how, Rod, it's probably, 
quite a good one for you. Like how how can you be encouraged to if you I don't want to use the word fail because it's not failing, but I've heard lots of people say, oh, I I lapsed or I, I had a drink or, you know, and this can be with anything, right? This could be, oh, I was I was going to the gym three times a week and then I missed so many sessions and I haven't been for ages and I'm rubbish and all that negative self-talk we give ourselves. How can you get back into that mindset, really? Mm. What would be your, your tips around that? Yeah, so I think, first of all, recognize was your expectation actually realistic or was it something you wanted or was it something that was forced upon you so for example it might be that actually you know you said right I'm gonna completely stop drinking and actually for you it wasn't it wasn't it was more a matter of just looking at the patterns but actually for you it's about having a drink occasionally and that's okay but you set perhaps your expectations or what you thought was right for you right on the extreme end so you know it's different for every single person that'll be very very different depending on the situation but what was what did you set as your expectation for yourself or your goal was that actually in line with who you are and what you want or was it a little bit too extreme for a start and if it was in line with you know what you want and what you want in your life and you've had a bit of a I mean, a la- again, the language is very important, isn't it? We have to be very careful about language. Like, I failed, I, yeah. I lapsed, I let myself down, I can't do it. You know, those things, if we say those words too much and use that language too much, we start to believe it. And then that feeds into that sense of shame. And that's more likely to then trigger those unhelpful behaviours to continue. So really use kind language yourself. Um, sit there and think to yourself, you know, I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. And actually in a way when you do have a little step back that almost that actually helps you remember and remind yourself even more of why you wanted to do it in the first place so go back to your why and look at that little lapse if you want to call it as a reminder a really good reminder and almost a, a little bit like a strengthener for your resolve to move forward also look at what was going on at the time you had that lapse what was happening emotionally what was going on around you what were the triggers and um, really be clear and identify those because that's going to be really helpful a really helpful tool and again a, a reminder about in the future what you're going to be more aware of and and replace those triggers with different strategies but above all you know no path to anything is ever straight it's always yeah. zigzagged it's always a bit back a bit forward a bit skew with a bit of a pause and that's okay because um, actually it's the journey that makes you remember and really sets in force those helpful patterns. Actually, the journey is the most useful thing. It's not just the outcome that's the most useful thing. Wow. That was brilliant. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> the chat, that's just kind of summed up everything in one day yeah. there. Like, oh. and yeah, I think it is. It's the journey is so important, right? Mm. We're not, you're not at a destiny. You're not aiming for something. It's just, this is life. You're just getting through it each day. And I think that's, with, I think we've learned a lot of that this year, if anything, to bring in that more mindfulness to, to what we're doing and speak more kinder to ourselves. So what I want to do in the last um, five minutes while we, we, we kind of get to the end of the conversation is, I know Tori, you haven't got yours yet. It's on its way to you. It's flying across <laughs> the ocean yeah. as we speak. But Raja and Dave, you have your um, glass of naughty. So this is Thompson okay. and Scott's, let me just get this right in the camera, Thompson and Scott's naughty. Um, I met Amanda Thompson, founder, um, a long time ago now when she launched uh, the, the Skinny Prosecco and Skinny Champagne because I wanted to drink more mindfully back then. I love champagne and Prosecco back in the day and um, it was just a healthier version, healthy hedonism. And then when I started going sober, I was um, so excited, genuinely so excited when they bought out Naughty as an alcohol-free option because for me, it is the closest thing to champagne because it's actually quite dry. It's um, 100% alcohol-free. Uh, Chardonnay grapes and what I love about it is vegan and it's only 14 calories per 100 mil so super healthy as well um, but I'd like Dave and I'm obviously a fan so we can <laughs> and, and Tori you can let me know what you think what you think of it when you finally get yours as your little surprise in a post but Radha and Dave what's mm. your thoughts on it because I know you've not tried it before what's your thoughts how do you think it tastes like give me a little um, give me a little review I actually can't taste the difference between that and an alcoholic version of drink. No. <laughs> no, I'm a, so bit, I'm a bit. I, I can't either. Can't tell the difference. But I wouldn't normally drink an alcoholic drink like this, to be honest. Um, so to me, it just tastes. It tastes normal. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So I. I this is the normal. kind of what drink. Is, what is normal? 
Yeah, that's the kind of drink that I would, you know, I, I would sometimes drink. But I have to say, I can't. The the taste is really nice. It doesn't really. I wouldn't. If someone gave me, you know, the the, the taste test, I wouldn't really go so no. between the, yeah. between either of them. Um, and I mean, I'm I'm not very good at describing what I taste. <laughs> but I'm not yeah. like one of those people who's on like a a sort of a cookery show, but. <laughs> but um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got the language for it, but it's really nice. I like yeah. it. Yeah, I say I would, you know, in a in a sort of a lovely kind of garden party or you know somewhere by a sitting by a river and drinking that. I wouldn't even think twice that it didn't have any alcohol in it. So I know yesterday as well when I took it, people were like, "What? There's no alcohol in this?" Because as well, it just looks it yeah, you know, it, it just looks apart. And you know, you popping the cork bef- right before <laughs> I was popping mine on my balcony. You know, thinking I was like. Oh. <laughs> but it is it's like a it's a real party drink and that's what it I love really about is, it. Yeah, it's a lovely colour. My days of popping bottles aren't over that I can still <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pop exactly. the bottle. <laughs> because because actually that is a really good point, isn't it? Mentally and emotionally, you know, when we ha- when we kind of have alcohol around celebrations, you know, the, the associations of the noise of it popping, the sparkles, the colour, you know, the smell, for example, they're all really powerful associators, aren't they? Of, of yes. what we associate with what we're drinking and how we feel and what makes us feel good so it's a very lovely color it's like a kind of rosé color as well which I like a lot yeah. Yeah. there you go you'll have to you'll have to let us know so um what I'd just like as well is Tori and Dave because obviously Rada gave this gave loads of hints and tips there about kind of maintaining your mindset and the journey and and kind of being kind to yourself Tori what would be your one top tip um for keeping like looking into being a more mindful drink, exploring, being sober curious, like what would be your top tip? Yeah, I was going to add on to what Dr. Rod has said about um, failure. So I actually don't use that word just because every single time I tried to go sober and quote unquote failed, it was actually leading me down the path that it would eventually would lead me to sobriety. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say the same thing, you know, be kind to yourself. Don't be too hard on yourself. And, um, commit to 30 days. So that's how I started was my therapist said, why don't you just, you know, I know you don't believe that this is linked to your mental health, but just start with 30 days. And once I got to the end of those 30 days, I reevaluated and I felt so much better. And then I had added so many things to my sober toolkit and I was able to take on another 30 days. Mm. And then you add and you, you know, empower, you have an empowering community to back you up and then you can add another 30 days. And so I would just say, start with a small amount of time. Start small. Brilliant. And Dave, what's your top yeah, tip? I'd second that, yeah. I, I, exactly what Tori's just said. And just going back to the point about just being honest with yourself, being honest with uh, yourself and those that are close around you because you're going to need, you know, need, but, you know, need some support so everybody, you know, understands and knows kind of what, you, what, what you're kind of going through, really. Um mm. And I told him the other day that I'd plug it, but listening to Andy Ramage's uh, TEDx talk, The Limitless Pill, for anyone that's kind of in the early stages and that's not feeling great about or struggling, you know, um, that's a, it's a really good, good one to watch. Brilliant. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. People can find out more about the retired party girl rpg as you called it at the start i love that it's like she's even shortened it down and you obviously got your course and workbook coming out soon so people can um get in touch and and find out more about your global community and you can of course follow the amazing kindness influencer dr rada who is on who's a fiend on twitter and instagram and she's on many great podcasts and shows but ultimately she just gives you that extra boost i think and always is such a source of inspiration and light and um of course champs we have uh, if you head to mymentalwealth.com you can find out about our eight-week health and well-being coaching platform which is on there and you can get in touch with us and also we've got uh, at naughty af if you go to uh you can put in mindful 2020 for thompson scott and get a discount on a case of naughty so might be but might be setting myself up now for a a summer of fizz. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone who's listened. I hope you have a great Sunday afternoon, Tori. Uh, guys, hope you have a great rest of your week as well. And yeah, let's uh, let's keep in touch. But thank you everyone for for 
for tuning in and listening. Thank you. Okay, thanks.